The anime started as a group of warriors take on some kind of rock monster. This giant's face gets all sliced up by these warriors as it is explained to us that all members of a party have various roles such as attacker and healer. Our protagonist is different though, his name is Rudd and he is a tank. Rudd saves a girl named Neen from getting squashed as it's the tank's job to draw all enemy attacks and protect the other members. Being a tank isn't the most glamorous position among powerful adventurers, but this is the story of how our boy Rudd changes all of that and becomes the protagonist. After the battle, Rudd imagines finally reuniting with his sister Manisha who he had to leave for battle, Neen snaps him out of it before he embarrasses himself even further, but Rudd is upset that she interrupted him. She reminds him that they are at a guild and everyone has been watching the weirdo because he was making weird faces, Neen wishes he would think more about her instead but Rudd crushes her soul when he declines. Rudd gets real serious as he explains that he doesn't want to think about anything else since his little sister has an incurable disease and his only hope is the secret treasure of the labyrinth that is set to grant any wish. This hope isn't looking too good now though, as Rudd thinks about how he failed everyone in the battle against the rock golem, Neen tells this absolute failure that he shouldn't feel bad at all since he did do his job. It just didn't make sense how fast his absorbed shield was depleting, even though he didn't get hit, Rudd reveals that it wasn't just that one instance. Recently, whenever they entered the labyrinth his absorbed shield's been depleting for some mysterious reason, he has had to consume a bunch of potions, so he apologizes for making things difficult for Neen as their healer. She once again tells him to stop apologizing since he always does a good job protecting her, Neen then glazes him up a bit by pointing out that his absorbed shield has a value of 9999, which makes it the highest value shield to ever exist. Just then spectators marvel as the one they call the hero arrives, he is the one who has beaten numerous labyrinths despite being so young, but this guy is clearly very arrogant. Everyone practically drools over this guy as he is the hero known as Kiglas, he apologizes to Rudd for being late as then welcomes Lilia and Lily, who are standing way too close to each other. Kiglas introduces them to their new party members, but Neen is furious. She reminds Kiglas that only parties of up to six people are allowed to enter the labyrinth. The addition of the two new members would make their group seven. Kiglas has a real dark side, as he reveals that their party will be down to six very soon and kicks Rudd out of the party. Of course Rudd demands to hear a reason, so Kiglas absolute jerk tells him that it's because he's a useless tank. A look back to the golem fight shows that Rudd was shaking after blocking the monster's attack. Kiglas did typical hero thing to defeat their opponent, but he was upset that Rudd instantly lost a significant portion of his shield. That was the final straw as he determined that the party wouldn't be able to make any progress with Rudd as their tank. Neen is still furious and points out that Rudd was blocking the attacks but for some mysterious reason his absorbed shield was still depleting, Kiglas thinks it's because of the two skills Rudd has that have unknown effects. Neen tries to defend him but Kiglas isn't interested in hearing excuses and reminds a little chick that they all could have lost their lives, the new members he found are better anyway. There are evasion tanks that have become very popular these days, evasion tanks are able to fight while dodging enemy attacks which is way better than Rudd who can only defend. Kiglas kicks him out for good so Rudd just accepts the decision, Kiglas is a serious jerk though and stops right from leaving just yet. He explains that they didn't make any money from the golem battle, so he will have to take something from him, Kiglas really rubs the failure in as he tells Rudd that he is just an incompetent tank that wastes absorbed shield. Kiglas then leaves with Rudd's sword while he laughs like an evil maniac, the conjoined twins know better as they thank Rudd and wish him luck, Rudd apologizes to Neen since she was the one that invited him to join her party, but he just wasn't good enough. Neen wonders if this is really goodbye but Rudd tells her to come visit him in his hometown one day, he hopes that day will come soon and Neen tears up at the kind words, she puts up a tough exterior though and says that she won't miss him. Afterwards, Rudd thinks about what to do next, as he can't go to his hometown yet, he wonders if Kiglas was right about Rudd's own skills chipping away at his absorbed shield without him realizing. He wishes he could figure out what his mystery skills do but adventures with the identify skill are extremely rare, his depressing train of thought is interrupted when he hears a group questioning if they can handle an escort job with just the three of them. Our eavesdropping protagonist over here is that they are headed to Kuras and his hometown is on the way, Rudd approaches them and we see just how big her boy is as he towers over the normal sized humans. Rudd asks if he could join them and doesn't even need them to pay him, even though our boy is clearly a giant, these dweebs wonder what rank he is. Rudd is actually only F Frank but it's because he has spent all his time in labyrinths, Rudd hesitates to answer but one of the little people recognizes him from the hero party. 
This height-deficient group stops being so skeptical and now beg Rudd to join them, the old guy they will be escorting his guide to hear that they have a new member but he has all his money tied up in crypto so he can't pay them more money. As they begin traveling, Rudd feels bad for not telling them his rank almost like he tricked them, if you really think about it, he could just tell them now but he decides to just protect the wagon as best he can. Their little journey begins and we see that their group endures a little battle, they also enjoy a meal and even have some type of love story going on as two of the short stalks make out in the woods. One foggy night, the old man wonders if they should rest soon, Rudd doesn't care how tired Grandpa is and tells him that they're nearly at Karas. He doesn't have a good feeling about something so they will head straight there, Rudd determines that they will be fine as long as they watch out for ambushes but he is shocked by something. He stops the wagon and tells the group to quiet down, Rudd goes alone to check if it's bandits but when the fog clears, everyone is shocked to see that it's just the girl. Rudd doesn't sense anyone else nearby and determines that it isn't a trap so he checks up on the girl, this girl is terrified for some reason so Rudd tries to be nice to her. A gust wind reveals that this girl has a gemstone embedded in her chest, but before Rudd can say anything a monster appears. It's a giant forest snake, so the little gem girl runs for cover and old grandpa explains that the monster's poison is deadly, the others are apparently cowards as they instantly give up without even trying. They are certain that their lives will end as the snakes go to attack them but our MC Rudd uses his provocability to attract its attention. The thing spits its poison out at our protagonist but he blocks it with his oversized shield, some of the snake's extremely dangerous poison burns right through Rudd's clothes but he tells the others not to worry. He has a skill that protects him from all status effects, Rudd tells the others to attack while he distracts the creature, but our boy really picked the wrong group of people to join as they have no clue where to even start. The snake decides to just knock everyone back and Rudd slams into a tree, Rudd has a vision of his sister calling out to him though and he wakes up, he refuses to let his life end here and gives an inspiring speech to his lackluster group. Rudd points out that he doesn't have a sword right now so it's up to them to cut the snake down, they still seem pretty lost so Rudd talks to them like they are brain dead and instructs them to grab their weapons and move their bodies. Rudd Rush is the snake while commanding everyone to work together and his teammates finally seem ready. Rudd declares that he is the strongest tank and proclaims that he will block all of the snake's attacks, while his team will have to do is believe in their own strength and he guarantees they will win. Rudd has prepared the perfect moment for them to attack and instructs them to move in, the newly inspired group follows his orders and manages the kind of do something to the snake. The old man freaks out and points out the obvious, he states that the snake is preparing to land a final blow and they need to dodge it. The snake is going right for Rudd but he determines that he cannot dodge the attack. It's more like he refuses to dodge though, as he knows that there is meaning and blocking the killing blow, Rudd then heroically blocks the snake making the perfect opening for the others to follow up. They combine their power and even amaze themselves when they finally manage to defeat the giant snake, the group then acknowledges that they couldn't have done it themselves. Rudd is a pretty big guy himself, so he knows a thing or two about dealing with the giant snake and he tells the others that what really mattered was that they worked together. He instructs them to carve up the snake, while he goes to check on the mysterious gem girl, he finds that she was running from the snake but she has nowhere to go. These two literally speak for like 10 seconds but he offers to take her back to his hometown and she agrees, Rudd doesn't want Chris Hansen getting the wrong idea though, so he decides that she needs some clothes. Old Grandpa just happens to have clothing for little girls laying around and gives it to them as a thank you, Grandpa wonders if she is an escaped slave and our boy can sense that she is a homunculus. Homunculus serves human slaves so they normally don't travel alone, so there must be some mysterious circumstance behind why she is in the forest. Rudd points out that slave traders likely wouldn't enter such a dangerous forest and she wasn't wearing a collar like all slaves in anime do, this girl is definitely a mystery but Rudd decides to look after her for a while. The next day, Rudd leaves the others after reaching their destination but the group wants him to join their party, they would be honored to adventure with a strong tank like him, but Rudd reveals that he needs to find the secret treasure. This group knows about it well, as this treasurer said to be able to grant any wish and even has the ability to create homunculi. The little albino girl is shocked to hear this word, but this group doesn't know that she is one and openly talk about how much they hate homunculi. They do some serious trash talking about how expressionless they are and how they don't show any passion in what they do. What's even scarier about the homunculi is that the only way to visually distinguish them from humans is the magic stone on their chest, or it is the only one that seems to notice that the girl is upset about what they are saying, so he quiets them down and leaves. 
The little girl shows some relief and they begin their own journey, Rudd introduces himself, but in typical anime fashion this girl reveals that she doesn't have a name. Some Lanafia petals are flying around everywhere so Rudd decides to call her Luna, Rudd fears that he might have offended her somehow but she actually loves the name. That night Luna spots some rabies-filled wolves and shocks Rudd when she springs into action to eliminate them all, this confirms what Rudd was already thinking, Luna must be an illegally created homunculus. This was made clear when she showed the will and emotions other homunculi lack, on top of that she can even fight. Illegally created homunculi must be disposed of but her frightened gaze reminds Rudd of his little sister, the little girl apologizes for ruining dinner but Rudd says it's okay. More importantly, he wants to know why Luna didn't just destroy the forest snake since she is clearly strong enough, Luna explains that she is skilled in magic but she doesn't have a single melee skill. This is surprising to Rudd and he determines that she must just be able to imitate the effects of skills, she goes over her list of spells but he is shocked when he hears that she can use the identify skill. Identify as a very rare skill, only one other person in the neighboring kingdom has it, but that person was said to have passed away a few years ago. This means that as of right now Luna is the only person in the world with the identify skill, Rudd desperately wants to know about the two mysterious skills he has so he asks her to use identify on him, she does so and reveals that Rudd has four skills. One is called healthy body, it makes him immune to status effects, boosts natural healing and makes his body as tough as possible. The next is provoke, it has the ability to focus on enemies attention on him, those are the two Rudd already knew about so he prepares himself to hear the two unknown ones. One of these mystery skills is called life conversion, this allows him to convert the absorbed shield that he has depleted into strength. Rudd has the highest absorbed shield value to ever exist and now there is a way to use it offensively, Rudd couldn't use it before so he determines that some skills can't be activated unless the person understands them. Rudd's final skill is called Shield of Sacrifice, this skill allows him to treat the absorbed shield of his allies as his own, while protecting his allies both his allies' toughness and his own increases. This means that while making them tougher, he can also take the damage of others. Things finally start to make sense as Rudd realizes that he was taking damage without realizing it, because he was using Shield of Sacrifice to protect his party members' absorbed shields. Rudd lets out a laugh as he has been worrying about his unknown skills for the longest time, but he never thought it would be resolved this easily, Rudd thanks his new little friend and she is glad she could be helpful. As they arrive at his hometown, Rudd thinks about the irony, he was kicked out of his party for having skills with unknown effects, but he actually had the ultimate skills for protecting his allies, knowing this he can return to his hometown with his head held high and finally see his sister again. The story continue, we see Rudd and Luna arrive at the peaceful town of Avancia and they are greeted by Milena and Fee, Milena runs up to Rudd and attaches herself to him like a leech but Fee peels her off. She tells Rudd they weren't expecting him to be back so soon, Rudd asks them what they are doing around the town and Milena tells him she came to get a hammer for her vocation while Fee was on patrol. Fee tells Rudd his sister is doing very well since she checked on her. Rudd tells her he can only go on adventures because he knows townsfolk like her are watching over his sister. Milena notices Luna standing behind Rudd and she asks him who she is. Rudd tells her he met Luna during his adventures and since she didn't have any place to stay, he took her into his custody for the meantime. Myrna and Fee introduce themselves to Luna, Rudd and Luna head home and when they arrive they go into the house. Rudd tells Luna his sister may be sleeping, so they need to be quiet so they don't wake her up. The sweet aroma of a freshly prepared meal passes Rudd's nostrils, and he recognizes it as his favorite tomato dish. Manisha walks out to welcome him with some strands of her hair standing on end and bobbing about, she asks Rudd who Luna is and he introduces Luna to her, explaining why he decided to bring her along with him. It has been so long since Rudd set his eyes on his sister and he thinks she still looks as cute as always. Manisha welcomes Luna to their home and she directs them to the dining table to have their meal, she goes back into the kitchens and dons her apron. She tells Rudd she's preparing another portion of the tomato dish and Rudd tells her to take it easy since her body is so frail, she tells him she's feeling perfectly good so she'll be alright. Rudd offers to lend her hand and she tells him she'll appreciate that, Luna asks Rudd about Manisha's hair and he tells her it's Manisha's unique ability, Manisha's hair moves according to her mood. Rudd asks Manisha if her skill helped her to predict that he will be coming home, she tells him it's not that straightforward but he tells her he's just so happy she prepared his favorite dish. Manisha starts chopping up the tomatoes and she asks Rod to lend her a hand, they finish preparing the meal take it to the dining table and sit down to have it. 
Luna picks up her spoon to have some sauce and Manisha points out that she's holding the spoon at a peculiar angle. She apologizes and sits on the floor telling Manisha she's only used a spoon a few times. She remembers when she tried to use a spoon while she was with a group of lost children in the forest and it didn't go so well. She apologizes to Manisha once again and she tells her she would do better. Manisha walks up to her and telling her there's no need to apologize. She takes hold of her hand and teaches her how to hold a spoon properly. She tells her she'll teach her how to use the spoon step by step and Luna thanks her. Rudd and Luna teach her other things like reading, cooking and cleaning and she acquaints herself with everything after some time. One day, she prepares breakfast for Rudd and Manisha and they're pleased with how much she prepared all by herself. They take a spoonful of the meal and they're delighted by the taste. Rudd is impressed at how Luna was able to master the fundamentals of life in just a few days. He wonders if that's the unique learning ability of the homunculi. After having breakfast, Manisha tells Rudd to give Luna a tour of the town. Since that day had such lovely weather, Rudd tells Manisha he can use that opportunity to introduce Luna to the town folk and Luna dreads meeting new people. Manisha tells him she'll lend Luna some of her clothes and she gets up from the dining table to get the clothes, she comes out with a blue gown and she tells Luna she'll help her dress. Luna takes the gown from Manisha and tells her she'll dress herself up, she rushes to her room and shuts the door behind her. Manisha asks Rudd if she somehow upset Luna, but he knows Luna was reflexive because she didn't want Manisha to see her magic stone. Rudd takes Luna to town and he tells her the town doesn't have a church or an adventurous guild just the blacksmith and the pharmacy, only the orchard stands out in the little town. As they are walking, Razel Malena's father says hello to Rudd and he introduces to him, Razel welcomes her to the town. Rudd tells Razel that he lost his magic sword and he asks him to help him make a new one, Razel tells him he will make a super sword for him in the shortest time possible since he made a special request. He tells him he'll solicit help from his daughter to make the process faster and Rudd tells him he'll come back for it. Razel tells him to show Luna the green magic garden before they leave. Rudd takes her to the garden where magic greens are growing. He tells her the vegetables are cultivated by magic, so their harvest isn't restricted by seasons, and they have a high nutritional value. Some kids walk up to Rudd praising him for getting a girlfriend. He tells them Luna is just his companion and not his girlfriend. They tease him, telling him he probably can't bag a girlfriend anyway because he has a sister complex, he asks them who taught them such a thing, and they rat out Fee. Suddenly, Granny Giggy calls out to the kids and orders them back to the garden, this makes Luna remember working as a slave in the past and the crack of a whip as it lands on the back of another slave and this sound makes her dreadful. Rudd tells Granny Giggy she's still as healthy as always and she thanks him for the compliment. She walks up to Luna, who is still lost in memory and asks Rudd if she's his girlfriend. He tells her she's not and he introduces her to the Granny, who is the town's pharmacist. She made a lot of drugs for Manisha to get better. Granny Giggy tells Rudd, Luna reminds her of how Manisha used to act when she was younger. She tells him she wishes she could do more to help Manisha's situation, but medicines are not enough to cure the root of her illness. Rudd tells her she has done more than enough to make their lives better. Granny Gigi tells Luna to come by the pharmacy if she ever needs help because she takes all children like her own. She asks Luna if she would like to join her to harvest some spinach. Some adventurers call out to Rudd, praising him for finally getting a girlfriend and getting rid of his sister complex. Granny Giggy takes Luna to the magic field and teaches her how to harvest the magic vegetables. She enjoys herself and at the end of the day, she has a basket full of vegetables. As they are heading home, Rudd apologizes to her about the gossip going on in the town and she tells him she doesn't mind, he tells her it's because she's so cute people can't help but fawn over her. She's shocked by this compliment, so Rudd asks her to try some of the magic vegetables they pluck to ease the tension. She takes a bite and tells Rudd it tastes good and Rudd tells her everyone in the garden will be glad to hear she likes it. Rudd tells her he likes Avancia compared to other towns because it's a small and quiet place, he asks her what she thinks of the town and she tells him that people are kind to her and she's happy to be in a nice place. She tells him she would probably be very happy to remain there forever. Suddenly, she grabs Rudd's hand and places it on her chest. She asks him if he can feel anything and he tells her he can feel a magic stone. She draws back her robe to show him the stone and tells him she's not human, she's a combat-type homunculus developed by a neighboring country. She apologizes to Rudd for keeping the secret from him, but she tells him she was scared she would be destroyed if people find out she is a homunculus, she starts shedding tears and tells him she couldn't keep deceiving him after he helped her so much. Rudd tells her he's been keeping something from her too, he already figured out that she was a homunculus because he already saw the magic stone. 
She asks him why he's still helping her and he tells her he and Manisha used to live in the slums before coming to Avancia. The look in her eyes when he rescued her reminded him of Manisha when they were still in the slums, so he couldn't just leave her alone like that. He tells her though they lived in the slums back then, they wanted to live just like humans. He asks her if she would like to live like a homunculus or like a human, telling her to answer honestly, she tells him a homunculus living as a human is just wishful thinking. Rudd tells her no rule says a homunculus can't live as a human, he tells her he has been raiding labyrinths searching for the treasure, containing a cure for Manisha's illness. He tells her since they both have an unattainable goal that inevitably makes them the best of friends, he extends out his hands to her and Luna thinks about the people and things she has experienced since coming to Avancia. She concludes she can live as a human if she remains at Rudd's side, she tells him she wants to live as a human and they shake on it. They return home, and Luna tells Manisha she has something to talk to her about, Rudd asks her if she's sure she wants Manisha to know and she tells him she doesn't want to keep secrets from people she cares about. She tells Manisha that she's a homunculus and apologizes for hiding it, Manisha asks her if she would like to be her friend regardless and Luna hugs her to seal their friendship. She tells Rudd he hasn't changed because he always reaches out his hand to help others despite their looks. The next day, Rudd and Luna join the other townsfolk to clean an estate. After the cleaning, Rudd thanks Luna for lending them a helping hand. Manisha comes into the room and tells everyone she made tea. A stampede ensues and Rudd joins the race making sure to be the first to drink it. He empties his cup telling Manisha her tea tastes great, especially when he's the first to drink. Fee tells him his sister complex never ends and he tells her to stop using such words. Rudd asks Manisha how she's feeling after helping with the cleanup, and she tells him all she did was make tea and he shouldn't worry too much. She tells him she doesn't want to be a burden to him even if her body is frail and he tells her she's never a burden. Rudd's friend asks him for a sparring session since they are done with the cleanup, he gets an idea and asks them to wait till after he spars with Fee, they go out to the field outside and Fee understands Rudd wants to test the skills he doesn't know about through sparring. He tells her he wants to go all out since he's facing the vice leader of the town guard, they set the sparing conditions and a referee starts the session. No one makes a move for a while and suddenly Phil swings into action but Rudd blocks her attack with his shield, which reduces his shield force. This continues for some time with each attack reducing his shield force, Rudd notices Fee has gotten a lot stronger since they last duel, Luna tells Manisha Fee looks strong and Manisha tells her unlike the town guards who don't leave the village. Fee and Rudd have the opportunity to go to other towns to hone their skills, so they are much stronger than the average town guards. The town guards members cheer for Fee while Luna and Manisha cheer for Rudd, he's distracted by their cheers and Fee takes advantage of this, she tells him he has a lot of time to be looking somewhere else during his sparring session, as she slashes at him with her sword. He blocks it with his shield, but her sword grazes him a bit and he thinks he can use her attack against her. He steps back but he loses his balance and Fee capitalizes on that to try to land a big attack, but Rudd blocks it and counters. Fee is knocked into the air and she falls to the ground, she's surprised he broke through her shield force in just one hit. The town guards members wonder if Rudd learned a new attack skill since he destroyed Fee's shield force with one hit. Rudd walks up to Fee and compliments her for getting stronger, but she tells him she's still not strong enough to beat him, she asks him what skill he used to defeat her and he tells her the skill is called life conversion. The skill allows him to turn the shield force consumed in battle into power, he thanks her for letting him use the duel to test the power of the skill, as a tank Rudd was always focused on defense but with this new skill he finally has some attacking power. He asks who would like to go next, but the town guards all chicken out. Luna tells Manisha that Rudd is amazing and she tells him he is unlike her, she remembers when she was abandoned, when she was younger and Rudd came back to rescue her. Suddenly she wakes up, it was all a dream but she wonders if Rudd is really happy, she knows he would be able to live more freely if he didn't have to look after her because she's held down by her illness. Rudd wakes up to see Manisha as finished preparing breakfast, he offers to help her arrange it on the dining table but she tells him she can manage by herself, Rudd sits down and grabs the day's paper. Luna comes barreling down the stairs and she apologizes for being late for breakfast preparation, she's surprised to see that Manisha has finished preparing breakfast. Manisha tells her it's because she's yet to get used to waking up early. Luna tells Rudd she feels bad for being so tardy and he tells her not to worry about it because the point of living together is to help each other. She feels like she's only on the receiving and doesn't give anything back. She tells Rudd he helped her to lead a regular luge and he taught her a lot as well. She asks him how he became so knowledgeable and he tells her about the apprentice system. 
The apprentice system is a master-to-apprentice relationship. It was a trend back in the day for nobles to guide children from the slums along the right path. This gave people like Rudd and Manisha the chance to study at the Knight Academy. This makes Manisha remember the time her classmates were talking about her holding Rudd back from chasing his dreams. Rudd calls her name, but she's lost in thought. He calls her a second time and she finally answers. He tells her he would be going to town and he asks her if she would need anything. She tells him she won't be needing anything and he goes to his room to dress up. In the past, they were still at the academy, Manisha was coming back from cleaning, she saw Rudd amongst his friends who were praising him for being the top student and everyone thought he would become a knight. She walked past to see some girls cleaning the windows and engaging in idle gossip. They heard that Rudd was going to become an adventurer to get a cure for Manisha's illness. They think he'll be wasting his potential if he becomes an adventurer, they blame Manisha for not letting him pursue his dreams. Manisha heard all that they said and she felt bad her very existence prevented her brother from taking all the opportunities open to him. Manisha is lying on the bed thinking about the past when Luna knocks on her door. Luna asks her if she's not feeling well but she tells Luna she was just thinking about some things. Luna walks up to her and touches her hand tenderly, she tells Manisha she looked sad, so she thought showing some affection would make her feel better. Manisha asks Luna what she would do if someone was willing to give up their life for her sake, she remembers when her brother came back just for her sake, instead of choosing a better path to make him happier. She asks Luna how she would face someone like that, Luna tells her she's not sure someone would be willing to go that far for her but she tells Manisha that person chose the path that makes him happiest. Luna figures out that she's talking about Rudd even when Manisha tries to deny it, she tells her to try and be honest with him. She recounts how Rudd helped her despite knowing she was a homunculus, and she tells Luna he sees things from a different perspective than others. Manisha tells her that she doesn't know how to face him, so she tries to convince herself that she doesn't need him, she tries to keep as much distance as possible, even when she wants to treat him so gently. She is conflicted with her feelings and Luna suggests she tell Rudd about her feelings. Manisha's skill activates indicating that Rudd is back from his outing, she wonders how she'll tell him about her feelings. Luna gives her some expert advice, telling her to say exactly what she thinks, Rudd sets down the fruit basket he got from the city. Both Luna and Manisha come out to welcome him and he's about to show them the magic green he got from the field but Manisha cuts him off. She tells him she has a question for him and he tells her to ask, she becomes tongue-tied with fear. She wonders if her brother will regret saving her but Luna holds her hand, which gives her the courage to ask, she asks Rudd if he's happy with the life he's currently living. He tells her he's very happy with it, she asks him how he can be so certain when there are other paths he could have chosen which would have made him happier. She asks him why he came back for her after she was abandoned. He tells her she saved him when they were younger, he reminds her of when they were younger and he was always called scary because he had a stern face and was bigger than the other kids. Back then, Rudd wanted to play with everyone but they just called him scary and ran away but Manisha always stuck by his side, Rudd tells her when he decided to live with her, he had some doubts but he never regretted his decision. He tells her he's the happiest when they get to spend some time together, this brings Manisha to feeds and she apologizes for assuming how he felt. She thought he was sad for having to put up with her, which made her unsure of how to face him, Rudd apologizes for not being able to express himself properly. She tells him she knows about that and that's why she needs to try to be independent, he tells her she doesn't need to. Rudd thanks Luna but she tells him she didn't do anything, Manisha tells Rudd she would have lost her mind worrying about it if it wasn't for Luna. She also thanks Luna and Luna turns around to hide her face, she tells them she'll prepare dinner and Rudd runs off to the kitchen, Rudd and Manisha decide to help with the preparations. Suddenly, someone knocks on the door and Rudd isn't happy that his time with his sister is being interrupted, he opens the door to find his old friend Neen standing outside. He asks her what she's doing there and she tells him she has come for him, since she has some time off. He tells her he's surprised her party leader Kiglas gave her some time off and she tells him it was the church gave her time off, she tells him she's not at the hero's party anymore. After Rudd left, their party was no longer successful in elaborate raids, so they disbanded, Rudd is shocked by the series of news Neen just told him. Neen recounts when they went on a raid and they came across a monster, they got into battle formation and one of their attackers tried to fight the monster but she wasn't doing any damage. The shield of the party was also draining faster than usual, Kiglas wondered what the missing link was and he realized it was Rudd, a new portal opens up and a huge monster comes out of it. Kiglas uses his life burst skill and it consumes a lot of his shield points, since Rudd left the party Kiglas realized his skills got weaker and his shield deleted a lot faster. 
He finally realizes he was wrong to let Rudd go, but he doesn't want to admit being wrong. He strikes the monster in front of him down, and he knows it's just one more left. One of his party members tells him the level may be too difficult for them. Kiglis doesn't listen to her and he just asks Neen to heal him, she doesn't want to heal him and he tells her he's not retreating because he can't fail again, he uses his life burst skill again but this time it doesn't work. The monster attacks him which depletes his shield force, his injuries hurt a lot more now that his shield force is depleted. The monster tries to attack him with its axe but Kiglis rolls out of the way, the monster prepares to attack again and Kiglis turns tail and runs, but the monster uses its fists to give him a boost on his behind. He punches Kiglas and he's knocked down, Kiglas begs for his life and one of his party members, Lilia comes to his rescue. She carries him back to the group and she asks her twin Lily to give them an escape route, Lily uses her special skill which teleports them out of the dungeon. The next day, Kiglas reads the paper news and he isn't happy with what he sees, he throws it away in frustration blaming his party for his ridicule in the papers, other party members apologize to him but Lilia tells him the others did nothing wrong. She tells Kiglas they failed several times because he charged in recklessly and got hurt. She tells him he stopped training for a while and he's frail from drinking too much alcohol. She tells him he cannot continue to rely on his life burst skill to conquer every labyrinth they go into. He tells her it's worked so far and as the same goes, if it ain't broke don't fix it. She tells him it only worked because they had Rudd. She knows he must have noticed how much weaker his skills had become. She reminds him that his skill consumes shield points, he unleashed his biggest life burst the day Rudd exhausted his shield points. From that day she realized Rudd was able to substitute himself for the depleted shield force. She tells him he used up Rudd's 9999 resistance point to make his skills so powerful. He told her Rudd had no hand in his oddness, he told her kicking out a useless tank can't affect him in such a way because he's a hero. They all walked out on him telling him they were leaving the party, he promised to recover quickly and prove to them that he was the strongest hero. Neen tells Rudd that was how the party disbanded, Rudd apologizes for the trouble he caused and he tells her he only figured out the effects of his skill recently. She tells him it was their fault for not realizing it earlier and she apologizes, she tells him they can now forget about the past and that everything is settled. Manisha and Luna walk in and Neen recognizes them, they greet her and she tells them she will be staying for a while, Rudd is surprised to hear this and she asks him if he wants her to leave so soon. Rudd tells her there are no inns in the town and adventurers who frequent the city have to rent rooms, Manisha suggests that Neen stays with them if she'll be willing to share a room. Rudd pulls her aside and tells her Neen is a noble and a saint, Neen tells him not to reveal any irrelevant information about her, Rudd just doesn't want to be on the church's hit for upsetting Nim. Rudd takes her to his room and tells her she can have it while he stays in the sitting room for the duration of her stay. Suddenly, someone comes knocking at the front door looking for Rudd, he opens the door and Phil tells him a huge monster she's never seen before just appeared at the orchard. They arrive at the orchard to find that it has been destroyed, they look around and Phil points out the monster, Rudd wonders what kind of monster it is but Neen tells him it's hard to make out because of the magic element covering it. She purifies it to get rid of the magic element and they have a good look at the monster, Rudd had never encountered a monster of that nature before, he thinks the monster is controlled by the magic element. Vwil tries to attack the monster from behind but it flicks its tail effortlessly to send Vwil flying, Phil and other soldiers come to help him to his feet. The monster tries to attack Vwil but Rudd uses his taunt skill to get the monster to attack him, he tells everyone who can use magic to concentrate their healing spells on him. The monster rushes at Rudd and he tries to squash him with its paw but Rudd uses his shield to hold the pot, he tells the others to attack the monster, while he tanks the monster's attacks. The monster just spins around to deal out some damage over a large area and Rudd can see that everyone is hurt, Neen and Luna heal him up and they tell him to go all out because they'll just keep healing him. He tells all the soldiers to attack without fear because he'll use his skill to transfer their damage to him. They all attack on Q as Rudd activates his skill, they land several attacks on the monster and it decides to run away towards the town. Luna uses her magic to create a wall that stops the monster, Rudd goes on to attack but the monster strikes first, Rudd dodges back and he decides to put the huge amount of damage he has received into one huge blow. He completely obliterates the monster and he forms a huge crater where the monster once was, the trees around the surrounding area were also destroyed. Rudd is worried about doing more damage than the monster, but everyone thanks him for taking care of the monster. The story continues, we see Rudd reads through the papers, but he can't find anything about the monster with two magic stones. Manisha greets him good morning, but she hardly gives him time to respond before planting herself on his lap. 
She asks him to read the papers to her but he's hesitant because he knows she can read and write, she begs him and he gives in to her cuteness. He stumbles upon news of a labyrinth appearing in Avancia, he recalls a farmer telling him it would be profitable for the area if a labyrinth appeared nearby. Manisha turns the page and Rudd sees a story about Kiglas raiding a new labyrinth and Manisha tells him, Neen doesn't like Kiglas because he makes fun of Rudd, Rudd tells Manisha that Neen is judging him based on her personal feelings. Manisha is surprised Rudd notices Nin's fondness towards him, she asks if he pretends not to notice because of her illness and he tells her he's the problem. He tells her he's a weak person who clings to that kind of relationship making him unable to raid labyrinths, he knows he's clumsy and he feels he won't be able to do both effectively at the same time. Manisha assures him that he'll be alright and she tells him to always care for her when he eventually finds someone special. Meanwhile, Fee gathered a group of adventurers to take down a chameleon Kong spotted in that area, she orders the adventurers to investigate the reason for its appearance and subdue it if they come across it, she also tells them the chameleon Kong could have come from a labyrinth, and she tells anyone who finds the labyrinth entrance to inform others of it. Luna notices Rudd's new gear it's made Melena and her father, his sword now has an enchanted skill which allows him to change the magic stone's mana and enchant the sword. Rudd can use magic of all elements but he can't use them enough to be effective in a battle, he summons a fireball which he channels into the sword's magic stone and turns it into a fire type sword, this means he can use the skill to target a monster's weakness. A young adventurer comes up to Rudd, telling him his sword is wasted on an F-rank adventurer, he tells Rudd to go home because he's too old to be an adventurer. Luna tells Rudd to say something back but he tells her he would rather be underestimated than overestimated, she tells him she doesn't like seeing him mocked and Neen tells him he's getting mocked because he hasn't updated his rank. She tells the adventurer Rudd is strong enough to be named a knight by her, but he turned down her offer when she asked him. The adventurer asks Rudd why he turned it down and Rudd explains that the guild summons adventurers with high ranks, his main objective was to find a cure for Manisha's illness, not to rank up as an adventurer. Suddenly the chameleon Kong appears camouflaged in between some trees, it tries to land a surprise attack on Fee but she blocks, the creature tries to stroke again but Fee blocks it and counters. Neen praises Phil's swordsmanship and Rudd tells her Fee is better than the average adventurer, he rushes to her side and uses his provoked skill to make the monster attack him, and he blocks the attack with his shield. Other adventurers surround the monster and attack it without it fighting back, though the monster's hits are heavy, Rudd is happy to see his strategy yield good results. Fee orders the adventurers to keep attacking but Rudd feels something is off. With its heavy hits and attention-grabbing roars, Rudd figured out that the monster was like a tank. Suddenly the monster beats its chest and two more chameleon Kongs emerge from the forest. The monsters surround them and Fee wonders what to do. She almost buckles under the pressure but Rudd tells her to maintain a positive attitude since she's the leader of the party. He tells her he trusts she'll find them a way out of this. She tells the adventurers to reorganize and get into a new formation. Rudd uses his provoking skill on all three monsters and the young adventurer thinks he's taking on more than he can handle. One of the monsters attacks Rudd but he blocks it with his shield, Luna uses that opportunity to launch a surprise attack on the monster. Rudd orders other adventurers to join in and finish it off, he leaves that monster to the others and he faces another one, he remembers chameleon Kongs are vulnerable to fire, so he enchants his sword with flames. The monster reels back in fear and he drives his sword through it to cause some damage, and he leaves Fee and her guards to finish it off. He now goes man to monkey against the last chameleon Kong, the creature throws a flurry of blows like a steroid pumped lunatic but Rudd blocks all its attacks. He gives Luna the cue to use her wind magic and the creature tries to get away but Neen immobilizes it with her water magic, Luna's magic hurts the creature and Rudd lands the finishing blow with his fire enchanted sword. Rudd looks around to check on the progress of others, the guards are rejoicing over defeating a chameleon Kong, but they know they wouldn't have been able to do it without Rudd's help. The young adventurer comes up to Rudd and tells him they finished off the other chameleon Kong, he commends Rudd for holding his own against the creature and Rudd tells him tanks never back down from adversity. He apologizes for making fun of him and Rudd tells him it's natural to be curious about the rank of others, since it determines their skills. Neen calls Rudd's attention to something in the forest, he looks to see the labyrinth entrance and a smile crosses his face. Later in the day, the whole village throws a party, Fee toasts to the appearance of a labyrinth and the potential development of the town. Luna notices everyone having a good time and Manisha tells her the appearance of the labyrinth could put an end to the town's population decline. Luna thinks that's great news but Rudd doesn't seem convinced, a young guard approaches Manisha and asks her out for a drink, 
Rudd enters overly protective brother mode and he tells the boy he'll drink with him if he wants to have a drink with someone. Neen meets up with Luna and she asks Luna if she's enjoying the party, she tells Neen she's enjoying herself but Rudd doesn't seem too happy, Neen tells her he's probably worried because not all labyrinths are good. Neen explains that a labyrinth comes with different problems, if the labyrinth monsters are not defeated, they can leave the labyrinth which will make them a threat to the nearby residents. Luna wonders why the town didn't gather adventurers to clear out the labyrinth, Neen tells her that also comes with its problems because anyone can become an adventurer, even evil people, they could use that chance to prey on the weak and get whatever they want. Luna asks Neen how adventurers should be organized and Rudd tells her it is by the clan system made up of several parties, adventurers who are part of clans are recognized by the country and given the responsibility of defending towns, entire towns can fall into ruin without a clan to guard them. Avantia has just a handful of combatants, which is not enough to make a clan, so adventurers who come to the town just do what they please, but Rudd doesn't want anything to happen to his beloved town. Neen offers to help him, telling him to wipe the scowl off his face, Fee comes out of nowhere and tackles Rudd to the ground rubbing his head like a good dog, Rudd notices she has too much to drink that night. Rudd is walking down the street the next day when he hears two people arguing, they are about to have a go at it but Rudd steps in and they flee for their life. Neen comes from behind him, commending him for doing well on his patrol, they take a walk through the town and she tells him she didn't expect so many adventurers to come after a week of discovering the labyrinth and Rudd agrees. The villagers thank Rudd for the work he did for them and Neen tells him she heard he has been fulfilling a lot of requests, he tells her that just trying to control the adventurers won't work. He hears there's a fight going on among the villagers and he sighs in exasperation, the fight is between two A-ranks adventurers called Boo and Gary from different parties. A fight between both of them wouldn't have a good result, as they are about to begin tearing themselves limb from limb. Rudd tells them to stop fighting because they are scaring the townsfolk, Boo tells him they're defending their clan's dignity and they tell him to stay out of their business. Boo also tells him that if he wants them to stop he should settle their debate, he asks Rudd which of their clans should be allowed into the town. Rudd tells them both their clans are not needed if they'll come to the town to cause trouble and he asks them to leave if that's the case, one of Boo's men tries to attack Rudd for disrespecting his master but Rudd stops him. Neen tells Rudd to stop wasting his time trying to break up the adventurer's nonsense, she tells them she won't go easy on them as she summons several huge magic circles which scares members of both clans. Rudd tells them the town has its own rules and he'll take them on if they're looking for a fight, they quickly apologize for being wrong and ask Rudd to join their respective clans, while arguing with each other. Rudd tells them to stop arguing because he would be joining neither, Rudd is glad to know that clan adventurers are different from individual adventurers because they know when to back down but Rudd knows he has to stay in town for a while to maintain its peace. Neen tells him she was shocked when they offered to let him join their clan and he tells her he was shocked as well, Rudd once dreamt of joining a clan that operated like a family of adventurers. One of the patrol guards walks up to Rudd and asks him about the clan dispute, Rudd tells him it has been settled and the guard tells Rudd to head to their headquarters because Wild is waiting for him, Rudd is surprised by this news. Vwild tells Rudd that the Lord contacted him regarding the situation of Avancia, he tells Rudd the Lord gave him two options, the first option was to get Rudd to create his clan and become the leader. Rudd tells Vwild it's so sudden and Vwild tells him it's reasonable because everyone has been singing his praises for a while, he tells Vwild he can't take on a position like that because he just wants to cure Manisha illness. Vwild tells him the townsfolk would rather have him as the leader than have an outsider brought in to become the leader, Vwild tells him the second option is to destroy the labyrinth in Avancia. Rudd tells him that would stop the town's development and Vwild tells him there are too many labyrinths in the country to be managed by adventurers. He tells him that improperly managed labyrinths cannot be left open, he tells him if he can't form a clan he should join the party currently exploring it and destroy the labyrinth. He asks Rudd to choose between becoming a clan leader and managing the labyrinth or destroying the labyrinth, Rudd just sits there dumbfounded. Later, Rudd is walking down the now busy street and he remembers Will telling him, he doesn't have to make his choice right away but he needs to decide as soon as possible. Rudd sees two men in a scuffle with one accusing the other of being a thief, but the other guy claims to have made an honest mistake. Rudd tries to break them up but they tell him off because he's just a mere adventurer, Rudd wonders if the only way to get things under control is to become a clan leader. Meanwhile, Luna calls out to him and she tells him to return to the house because something has happened to Manisha, he returns home and rushes to her room. He asks Grandma Gigi if she's alright and she tells him she's just under the weather, Manisha apologizes for worrying him and she asks him about the town, but he tells her not to worry about it. 
Rudd knows if he becomes a clan leader, he won't be able to leave Avantia and visit any labyrinth he wants, he wonders if he'll be able to find the wish-granting secret treasure but he knows if he stays in the town, Manisha would never be cured. He asks Neen and Luna to help him destroy the labyrinth, Neen warns him that his action would deprive the town of development and he tells her if he has to choose between the town and Manisha, he chooses Manisha. Luna asks him if he has to stay in the town if he becomes a clan leader and he tells her he has to till things settle down. Luna suggests he chooses someone to represent him and lead the clan in his place, but Rudd doesn't want to force the position on anyone. Luna tells him she would gladly protect the town in his place if he wants, she tells him she wants to give back to a town that has been so kind to her. Neen offers to help Luna, she tells Rudd she'll quit being a satin and join his clan to help. Rudd is overwhelmed by their offer to help and Neen tells him it's only natural they help him after he's helped them so much. Neen also tells him to do what he has to do and stop holding back. Manisha comes out with the help of Grandma Gigi, Rudd tells her she should be in bed but she tells him he doesn't have to protect her anymore. She tells him she's alright and she asks him to protect the town if there's a way he can do it. Rudd can see she's not completely fine and he tells them he will protect both Manisha and the town, he asks Luna and Neen for their help and they promise to help him achieve that. The story continues, we see Rudd walks through the street with Luna and Neen towards Avancia's labyrinth. He remembers when he pledged to both protect the town and find a cure for Manisha. He wanted to get some members to form a clan, but he was summoned by some adventurers exploring the labyrinth. Rudd didn't expect to find his old party exploring the town's labyrinth. They arrive at their tent and meet some of their old squad members waiting outside, Lilia and Lily the twins introduce themselves to Luna. Sugar opens up the tent so they can start the meeting, but Rudd sees Kiglas sitting almost fully covered in bandages. Kiglas greets Rudd, but Neen angrily tells him he has no right to ask Rudd for a meeting after all he did to him. Rudd tells her not to worry because it's all in the past, he asks Kiglas to explain why he called the meeting. Kiglas tells him they encountered Ascension Guardian the previous day and Rudd is surprised to hear this. Adventurers have never been able to converse with the Guardians of Labyrinth they've encountered, even the humanoid ones. Kiglas tells him the encounter is what put him in his current predicament, he tells Rudd he should explore the Labyrinth and finish his mission, since he's not restricted to a chair. Lilia explains that Kiglas is trying to apologize to him by having Rudd finish his mission, though he doesn't want to admit it. Kiglas tells Rudd that he can get the secret treasure of the labyrinth to cure his sister that way. Rudd is surprised he still remembered that and Kiglas says he now understands that Rudd was the one enabling him to fight when they were a party. Rudd tells Kiglas he's going to borrow his party members for the mission and he begins to leave, Kiglas apologizes for the way he treated him in the past, and he tells him to be careful in the labyrinth. Neen still can't believe Kiglas apologized for his actions but she's glad they have a full party for the mission. They arrive at the labyrinth entrance and Rudd announces they will start raiding, they walk inside and step into a teleportation circle to the first floor. They are teleported to a huge clearing and Luna can't believe such a big place could fit inside the little entrance of the labyrinth. She's also surprised to see the sun but Rudd tells her that the sun doesn't move so she shouldn't lose her concept of time. Rudd tells her the space inside a labyrinth is warped and impossible things happen easily. The magic circle disappears and Luna gets worried, she asks Rudd how they'll get out and he tells her they'll have to find a different magic circle to take them out. Neen tells Luna she doesn't have to worry about that, because Lily has a special skill called Dungeon Walk, this ability allows them to travel easily between the floors they've already visited. Usually only 6 people can benefit from the effects of a skill, so only 6 people can be moved through floors by Lily, Rudd tells Luna there's another spell similar to Dungeon Walk. He tells Neen to show it to Luna and she stretches out her hand to bring up a magic circle, Neen explains to Luna that her spell is an emergency escape spell. Luna decides to try to cast it and she casts it easily, everyone is surprised she was able to learn and cast the spell in such a short time. Rudd knows that she was able to learn the spell so quickly because of her combat homunculus ability. Lily suddenly hears the pounding of feet and she tells everyone three chameleon calms are heading towards them. Rudd gets into battle mode, he directs Sugar and Lilia to hold their front while Lily and Neen support and heal from the rear. He tells Luna to position herself in the best spot to overlook and protect everyone, he tells them he would be their shield and take most of the damage. The monsters leap into the air to attack and Rudd uses his provoking skill on one of the monsters. The second monster rushes at Sugar and attacks him but Sugar blocks its attacks. 
The third calm goes for Lilia, Neen, and Luna, but Lily casts ice platforms over it that she uses to get into the air and land an aerial attack, seriously injuring the Kong. She attacks again, and this time she takes off the monster's left arm. Rudd encourages the group to keep up the attack, and he assures them they'll win if they do. Meanwhile, a stranger is watching them through a crystal ball, and he's intrigued by their skills. They defeat the monsters, and Lilia uses her dungeon walk skill to take the group to the level where they previously encountered the Guardian. She tells Rudd they're at the level of the Guardian, but he's nowhere in sight. Suddenly two Fieldosaurus attack them from behind, but they jump away at the nick of time to avoid the attack. Rub notices they attack faster than normal and he wonders if it's the effect of the Guardian. He tells the group he'll take care of the monster, and he tells them to find the magic circle that'll take them away from that level. Rudd uses his provoking skill to make the monsters attack him, while Lilia and Sugar lend him a hand. Sugar tells him they need to defeat the monster through combined effort, so they save their strength for the Guardian. Neen looks around the floor and she finds the magic circle, she informs Rudd and he tells the party to hurry to the magic circle. The stranger watching them thinks he's made a wise decision, the stranger watches them as they defeat monsters and move through floors. They are currently on the ninth floor and the stranger can't wait till they get to him. Neen tells the group, the last floor of the labyrinth is the tenth floor and Rudd thanks them for putting up with his selfish desire. They wonder where that came from all of a sudden and Lilia tells him he doesn't need to apologize since he's doing it for his sister. She tells him they all know how important family is, and they would do the same if they were in his shoes. They all walk into the circle and they tell him not to thank them yet because the main test is still ahead of them. Neen stretches her hand out to Rudd and gets up to take it, he enters the magic circles and he assures them they'll defeat the Guardian together. They arrive at the third floor, it's a grassy plain with a thunderstorm going on overhead, the stranger applauds them for fighting impressively and reaching the top floor at last. Rudd recognizes him as the Guardian and the Guardian tells them he didn't expect them to be so powerful, he welcomes them to his labyrinth and introduces himself as Marius. Rudd tells him he heard the previous party found him on the fifth floor, Marius tells him he had to wait for them on the last floor so he could go all out, he tells them that the tenth floor is his domain and they'll soon experience the full potential of his strength. Marius suddenly unsheathes his sword and attacks Rudd in an instant, though Rudd can block his attack, Marius is so strong that Rudd feels like his arms are about to tear away from his body. Marius tells Rudd he's impressed he was able to block his attack, he tells Rudd he was worth the wait and he jumps back to create distance between them, Rudd tries telling Marius he didn't come to fight him but to talk to him. Marius casts a spell and he prepares to attack Rudd, he tells Rudd that's how men discuss and Rudd decides to fight now and negotiate later. They attack Marius consecutively and Lilia tries to land a surprise attack from behind but he blocks them all, they begin to wonder if he has eyes at the back of his head. Marius tells them he's now going to use his full strength to fight them, and he advises them to run with the little strength they have left. Marius transforms into a huge undead skeleton and though Rudd can see how powerful he is, he can't turn back because he has to cure Manisha. Marius attacks Rudd with more powerful sword strikes but he blocks them all, Lily creates a wind platform that Lilia uses to launch an attack on Marius. Sugar suggests they take turns holding the attention of Marius and Rudd agrees, Sugar uses his provoked skill to get Marius to attack him. Rudd looks at everyone's shield point and he advises them not to let Marius hit them head on, he tells Neen and Lily to help with healing and support, he asks Luna to join them to take down Marius. He uses his provoked skill and Marius turns his attention to him before coming to the labyrinth. They knew they were in for a long battle, but they were convinced they would win because of Rudd's skills. They had faith in his life conversion skill that allowed him to turn his absorbed shield lost into an attack skill. Lilia manages to land a huge attack on Marius, but she looks so exhausted and Luna gets worried she'll collapse. Neen tells her they'll be fine as long as the back line remains standing, she tells Luna to be patient and endure and she focuses on healing the front line. Rudd notices Marius' movements are slowing and he wonders if he's getting tired. Rudd's absorbed shield has been depleted by a lot and he decides to use his life conversion skill to land a powerful attack on Marius. They think they've won but Marius remains undefeated but he looks hurt. Rudd can see his attack was effective and he knows if he's able to hit him with another life conversion skill they'll win. Suddenly, Marius uses his magic skill to hurl huge rocks in them, Rudd uses a defensive skill to try to protect them but Lily is hurt, Lilia rushes to her side but Lily assures her she'll heal from the wound easily. 
Sugar is swatted away by Marius and he bounces off the ground like a skipping stone several times before coming to a halt. Rudd goes over to help him and he tells Rudd he can keep fighting but Rudd can see he's having trouble moving, he looks at the rest of the party and he sees they're exhausted as well. Rudd doesn't feel too good about exposing others to danger just to achieve his own goals, he doesn't want to risk their lives anymore, so he tells them to retreat. Neen is surprised by this, but he tells her he has to make the right choice as the leader of the party. Neen can't believe Rudd wants to give up on his dreams after making it so far, Sugar tells Rudd not to underestimate him because he gave the retreat order after looking at him. Sugar tells him he's still strong and he's ready to fight to the death, Neen tells him not to make them look so pathetic by telling them to retreat, so Rudd asks for their help to save Manisha. Lilia and Lily fuse and turn into Lilily, they begin attacking Marias several times and Sugar attacks as well. Luna and Neen provide support from the back and Rudd is grateful to them all. Sugar absorbs shield breaks but Rudd decides to bring down Marius with one final strike, he uses his life conversion skill and he lands his attack. Marius almost falls but he anchors himself with his hand and tries to land a counterattack on Rudd, Rudd knows his absorbed shield will break if the attack lands but he decides to absorb it and turn it into his strength. As Marius lands his attack, Rudd converts it with his skill and counters bringing down Marius. The weather clears up and Rudd is exhausted, Marius turns back to his human form and he tells Rudd the battle was fun. Rudd tenses up, ready to attack but Marius tells him he can't move anymore, he tells Rudd to do what he wants and Rudd is surprised the battle is over, he tells Rudd the battle isn't fully over till he brings him down for good. Rudd tells him he came to talk and not to battle, he sits down with Marius and he asks him if he has the secret treasure of the labyrinth which grants any wish. Marius ruffles through his pockets and tosses the magic stone to Rudd, he tells Rudd the stone is capable of performing miracles, he tells him the stone can only be used once, so he should use it wisely. He tells Rudd to finish him off now that he has the stone but Rudd tells him he doesn't want to destroy the labyrinth because there's a town nearby that depends on it. Rudd tells Marius he would like him to continue ruling the labyrinth as its guardian and Marius is glad to work with him. Later, Rudd returns home and he gives the stone to Manisha and she's grateful to him, Manisha uses the stone to grant her greatest wish and she suddenly feels much better. Rudd is so happy to see this and he's sure he can cure her completely if he continues adventuring, he's glad all his efforts haven't been in vain and Manisha thanks him for making her feel better. The story continues, we see the hunters are hyped to take down the Fieldosaurus around the area, Rudd looks at how lively the town has become after the labyrinth appeared nearby. The thought of the number of scuffles he'll have to break him makes him weary. Boo and Gary walk up to him and Boo notices that his new clan leader position is telling on him. Gary suggests he gets an assistant to take some weight off his shoulders and Rudd tells them he has a request for them both in line with that, they are confused by this. Rudd returns to the clan house and Neen can see that he's tired, she wonders if he broke up another scuffle between adventures. She's having some feel to Soros meet and she now understands why the adventurers always go for their materials. She tells Rudd they'll need to recruit more people to help manage the clan and Rudd agrees with her. He put Manisha in charge of office work but he doesn't want to push her too hard, he asked Lilia but she told him she didn't know enough to teach someone else how to become an adventurer. She suggested to Rudd to partner with other clans and try to ally, she told him it had to be an equal alliance else it would defeat the purpose of establishing a clan in the town. She told him no clan would agree to that unless he offered them something beneficial and Rudd agrees with her, since his clan is made up of his companion. Lilia hoped that Rudd had something to offer so he could quickly form the alliance and create a clan. Rudd tells Neen the only thing they have to offer is combat strength, since Rudd told other adventurers they drove off Marius to protect his safety, he'll need someone else to manage the clan instead of him. Rudd tells Neen he has been doing what he can since he spoke with Lilia, Neen tells him she is convinced their clan will become formidable in no time, but Rudd can hear a tone of disappointment in her voice. He asks her why she is disappointed and she tells him if they become a big clan they'll have less alone time, Rudd is speechless. Neen tells him if he's having a hard time getting people to join the clan, he can use her to promote the clan to others, Rudd tells her he can't do that because she won't like it. Suddenly, Marius bursts into the clan house and he tells Rudd he wants him to manage the labyrinth, he sees Rudd and Neen in a suspicious position and he asks them what they are up to. Rudd denies any activity between him and Neen and he tells Marius, he's too busy to manage the labyrinth. Marius decides to sign up as a clan member and help Rudd stop fights, Rudd tells him that's not the only thing keeping him busy and he asks Marius if it's okay for him to wander around so much since he's a labyrinth guardian. 
Marius tells him it's not an issue and Rudd asks him if he has any grudges with humanity, Marius is surprised that Rudd asked him such a question. They think he has a grudge against humanity but he tells them he has no grudge whatsoever, and they're surprised. He tells Rudd he'll help him with his clan duties while he manages the labyrinth, Rudd gives in and tells Marius he'll allow him to become a member. He asks Marius to fill him in on how to manage a labyrinth and Marius rushes out excited. Rudd can't believe he's so happy even if he hasn't agreed to manage the labyrinth, he sighs tiredly, resigning himself to his fate. Marius and Rudd arrive at the labyrinth to find a lot of adventurers gathered at the entrance, Marius creates a portal and they both walk through it. Marius tells Rudd he'll be able to manage the labyrinth from that location, he tells him that the lake shows the interior of the labyrinth and he can use it to place monsters to change the labyrinth construction. Marius explains that the lake displays the points available at the top which Rudd can spend to create and replicate monsters, Rudd asks him if the points increase on their own and Marius tells him the points increase over time, depletion of the absorbed shield of adventurers also increases the available points. Rudd figures out that if his absorbed shield is depleted by a huge amount, he'll be able to gain a reasonable amount of points. He asks Marius to show him how the operation works and Marius replicates a goblin and summons it somewhere in the labyrinth. Rudd pulls his cheek, telling him he'll scare away the adventurers if he keeps doing that, he asks Marius if he can replicate any monsters except goblins and Marius gives him the list of monsters they can replicate. He tells Rudd that monsters can only be replicated from an original that has been created, he tells him the monsters could take a liking to him and help him in his time of need if he builds a bond with them. Rudd is surprised that monsters can take a liking to humans, Marius is about to create a monster that costs a million points but Rudd tells him the cost is too much, Marius tells him that's where grimoires come in. Grimoires allows them to create monsters at random like a gacha game, he tells Rudd to give it a try, and Rudd randomly creates a slime. The slime immediately takes a liking to Rudd and Marius tells him they can now replicate the slime. Rudd figures out that with time, they'll be able to create S-rank monsters, he knows that most of the adventurers come to the labyrinth to hunt the field of hours and get their materials, but once the adventurers had obtained enough of its materials, labyrinth activity would die down. The ability to create random monsters will allow them to generate monsters to keep the adventurers busy within the labyrinth, Rudd is happy because that will also help him manage his clan. The slime suddenly gives Rudd's head slam which sends him flying, Marius tells him they got 1000 points from the slime hit, he's happy they were able to create a rare slime. The slime moves to Rudd's side and Rudd thanks it for giving him a brilliant idea, Rudd tells Marius he'll take over the labyrinth management. Marius is surprised by this, but Rudd tells him he won't be taking over just yet till he thinks about the kind of labyrinth that'll attract more adventurers. He asks Marius to keep managing the labyrinth until then and Marius agrees, he asks Marius what he should do with the slime and Marius asks him to take it along. Later, Rudd takes it home to the surprise of Manisha and Luna, Luna tries to protect Manisha from the slime but Rudd tells her it's friendly, he decides to give it to Manisha as a pet and Manisha tells him they'll have to give it a name. Rudd decides to name the slime Lime and the slime looks satisfied with the name. Elsewhere, we see Boo takes Rudd's request to his clan leader, his clan leader is surprised that Rudd wants to merge clans. His assistant tells Boo to reject rude requests since his clan is so weak but the leader decides to send him an invitation. Gary also takes Rudd's request to his clan leader and she sends him an invitation. Several days later, Rudd and his companions go to the town of Kield accompanied by Lilia and Lily, the town was bigger than they expected. Lily is looking forward to attending the town ball but Lily A dreads the thought of it, Marius notices some flags and Rudd tells him it's the clan flags for the black dragon Fong and the white tiger claw. He remembers when both clans sent him an invitation to a ball they were hosting in the town of Kield, he gathered everyone to tell them the news and they were happy for him. Neen figured out that it wasn't a mere invitation and she asked Rudd what the catch was, Rudd told her they rejected his proposal to ally and they would only consider it if they served under them. He told them they also demanded Neen in exchange for their cooperation because she's a famous saint, Rudd tried reaching out to other clans to ally but those also wanted to use Neen as leverage. Neen couldn't believe she was so popular and she asked Rudd if he'd be willing to trade her, Rudd told her he'd only let her go if she wanted to go but he won't let her go otherwise. She told him she doesn't plan to be part of any clan except his and he promises to reject that condition if it's ever brought up. Rudd told them he plans to attend the ball, though it'll be in enemy territory, he couldn't pass up an opportunity to discuss with the representatives of the two major clans, Neen agreed that he couldn't pass up that opportunity. 
Marius told Rudd that he saw a labyrinth in his lake that also had a sentient guardian like him that was named after the town called the Keeled Labyrinth. Rudd thought he may be able to completely cure Manisha if he raided the Keeled Labyrinth and obtained the magic stone. Neen told him that she heard that even the two major clans hadn't been able to clear the labyrinth. Rudd told her they've all grown individually and they form a good party, Neen figured out that they'd be raiding the labyrinth and asking the major clans for help. Rudd knew that the journey wouldn't be easy but he was willing to put everything on the line to ally and lay his hands on the treasure of the labyrinth. Later that day, they get dressed for the ball and they proceed to the venue, they arrive at the Black Dragon building, and they can't believe the place is owned by a clan, Lilia tells them the White Tiger Claw also owns a similar building. The doors open up and the guests pour into the room, they soon start to notice Neen and they think she's there to ally with the clan. Rudd can't believe they're talking like she's their clan representative and Neen tells him to show them his medal as their leader. Rudd wasn't comfortable at the ball but Marius was having the time of his life. Rudd decides they need to get something to eat and they go over to a table. Suddenly the lights go off and the stage lights come on. Ike and Cynthia, the sub-leaders of both clans begin addressing the crowd. Rudd is disappointed the leaders of the clans aren't the ones addressing them. Like tells the crowd they invited a special guest and Neen is put under the spotlight. They invite her to come on stage and she tells Rudd that she can't go alone since she's part of his clan. Rudd decides to go with her to lay a complaint, Ike is surprised to see that Neen became an adventurer and she tells him she has always been waiting to become one. They get on stage and Ike asks her who Rudd is, the guests at the ball also cannot recognize him. Neen is about to introduce Rudd but Rudd introduces himself, he tells them he's the leader of Nin's clan but Ike knows he was previously the tank of the Harrow's clan. He remembered that the hero always complained about Rudd, so he advised him to kick Rudd out of his clan. Ike tells the audience that tanks aren't needed to raid labyrinths, they just stand around doing nothing. Everyone agrees with him and Ike decides to use this opportunity to invite Neen into their clan, Cynthia stops him telling him her clan also needs a talented healer to help them raid the labyrinth. Rudd tells them he's not letting either of them take in Neen, Ike tells him that's the only way for him to get the advisor he needs for his clan. Rudd tells him he can't trade Neen because she's a valuable friend, Ike asks him why he's attending the ball if he isn't there to trade and Rudd tells him he's come to ally. They all make fun of him for wanting to ally with major clans when he's just a tank with a measly clan. Ike tells him he can't trust a clan led by a tank and he asks Neen if she's sure she wants to remain with him, Neen tells him she's sure of her decision because Rudd is the world's strongest tank. Rudd walks up to Cynthia and borrows her mic. He tells everyone his clan is there to raid the Keeled Labyrinth and he's there to prove everyone wrong, he vows to reach the 51st floor that not even the two major clans have been able to reach. The leader of the Black Dragon Fong tells him he loves his vibrant spirit, Ike is surprised his leader was at the ball and the leader tells him to cut out his habit of underestimating the newbies. Gosh, the leader introduces himself to Rudd and they shake hands, Rudd can tell from the handshake that Gosh is very strong. Gosh takes the mic and tells everyone he's willing to ally with Rudd if he wants to raid the labyrinth, he tosses the phone out and the leader of the White Tiger Claw, Ms. Little comes out of her camouflage. She tells everyone she will also be willing to ally with a clan that says they can conquer the labyrinth, Gosh tells Rudd to live up to his words if he's serious about a lying. Later, they return to their lodge after the ball and Marius wonders why no one acknowledges Rudd's strength. Rudd tells him you can't tell how strong someone is just by their looks, but Marius tells him powerful people recognize other powerful people. Marius promises Rudd they'll conquer the labyrinth and shame the people who ridiculed him. Marius goes to take his bath and Rudd tells him to be careful. Luna and Neen meet up with Rudd to tell him goodnight and Rudd vows to conquer the labyrinth for the sake of his friends. The story continues, we see Rudd vows to conquer the Kaled Labyrinth to protect his friends. Lilia comes out of her room and tells Rudd she needs his help with something and quickly drags him into her room. Rudd wonders why she's suddenly so secretive and he looks up to see her, looking very embarrassed. She asks him to help her with the strings on her dress and he helps her with the strings and the bow. She thanks him for his service, happy that she can now surprise her sister with a cup of tea. Rudd is about to walk away, but she stops him. She tells him she would like to ask him something serious, so they go somewhere private. She asks him if he's going to become a clan leader, and he tells her he will. She was impressed with the way he boldly stated his intentions at the ball. She tells him she's too weak to tell anyone what she wants to do, and Rudd asks her what she would like to do. She makes him promise not to laugh at her because she doesn't have a grand goal like him. She tells him she doesn't want to rely on her sister forever, so she wants to learn to support herself whenever Lilia is around, she doesn't have to worry about anything because Lilia takes care of everything. Since they were kids, 
Lily always made mistakes, but Lilia always protected her. Lily knows that Lilia is perfect and capable of doing anything, especially when they fight. Lily can only give her support from behind and Rudd tells her that's because she's a magic user. Lily tells him Lilia is also a magic user, but she can engage in close-range fights. When they fuse, Lilia's personality is usually the dominant one, and Lily has never fought by herself before. Rudd always wondered who was in charge of their shared body. Lilia tells him she doesn't want to keep imposing on her sister and she wants to be able to take care of herself. Rudd now sees the reason why Lilia pulled him aside to talk to him. He understands why she's apprehensive about telling her sister that she wants to be more independent, given how close they are. Rudd tells her to give her dreams a shot and she's overjoyed. She's about to tell him when next she'll need his help, but she loses her balance and Rudd tries to catch her. Lilia comes out of the bathroom because she heard Rudd's voice, but she sees them in a suspicious position. Lilia enters an enraged state, and Rudd tries to explain that they ended in that position by accident. She tells him to go up the roof with her, and when they get there, he wonders if she's going to push him off. She asks him why he's being so cautious around her. She says she would have pushed anyone else off the room, but she'll let his offense slide. She knows that he'll never do anything to hurt someone else's younger sister because of his love for Manisha, she was just pretending to be angry at him to get him up the roof. Lilia asks him if she ever told him their story and he remembers her saying they were abandoned by their parents. She tells him the more accurate story was they were being abused by their parents so they ran away. Lilia remembers their father was particularly cruel, which makes it hard for Lily to have a conversation with men. Another reason she wanted to talk to him was because Lily opened up to him. She tells him she would like to take Lily to a place where she can truly be happy, but she wants to keep her safe till then, Rudd can see that they love each other. He tells Lilia how Lily described her as perfect and being capable of anything. Lilia tells Rudd she's anything but and he agrees with her. He tells her she loses her cool when it comes to her sister and she almost seems like a different person. She calls him a hypocrite for saying that and he laughs it off. She thanks him for listening to her and he tells her she can always talk to him about anything because they are dear friends, she promises to tell him if anything happens. The next day, the group heads to the Keeled Labyrinth. Lilia and Lily were already there and Rudd hoped they didn't keep them waiting too long. Lily tells him she just got back from the 49th floor and Rudd is shocked. She tells him she was escorted there by the dungeon's explorers and she can now teleport them all to that floor with her dungeon walk skill, they're all happy that she saved them sometime. She tells them she didn't go to the 50th floor so they could gauge the monster's spawning frequency. Lilia tells Rudd she has been gathering some information. She looked into the party compositions the two major clans used during their raids. The Black Dragon Fong took four attackers, including their leader and two healers for support, while the White Tiger Claw took four magic attackers and two healers. They both used speed function compositions, and Rudd figures out that their attackers functioned as tanks. She tells him the floors have a lot of monsters that inflict status effects, and Rudd is glad his healthy body skill can nullify that. They know the labyrinth will be challenging, but they're prepared to give it their all and reach the 51st floor, so they can ally. They enter the labyrinth and Rudd tells Marius to guard their rear while he leads. He tells Luna she'll be their melee attacker, while Lilia adapts to the situation like she always does. He tells Neen she'll be their healer, but he notices Lily is uncomfortable. He asks her what's wrong, and she asks him if she can assume commands during the battle, and Lilia is surprised. Rudd can see she's already trying to change and he tells her to give the commands while Neen assists her. Lily uses her dungeon walk skill and they go up to the 49th floor. Rudd can see the floor isn't suitable for speed-focused fighters, but it'll be convenient for a tank. Marius tells everyone that there are monsters nearby and Rudd notices it's true. Neen is surprised that Rudd can tell there are monsters nearby. Marius tells him it's a perk of being the manager of the Avancia Labyrinth. Marius can see that the two paths before them lead to the same place, and monsters are blocking both paths. He realizes that if they go down one path, monsters from the other path will attack from behind and put them in a pincer attack. They can see that the Labyrinth Guardian is very tricky. Suddenly two monsters appear on either side of them. Rudd provokes the Poison Lizard and the Black Owl. They begin attacking him with a Poison Mist, but Lily clears it. Rudd takes down the Poison Lizard because he's immune to status effects. The Black Owl then attacks him, but he shields himself and he tries to counter but his attack is useless. He wonders if the Owl used magic to block his attack. Marius takes the Owl down with one strike, but another one comes from the path ahead. This one flies towards Lily, but Lilia comes to her aid and takes it down before it can hurt Lily. More Black Owls come from the path, and Lily suggests that they don't waste time fighting the Owls. 
Rudd tells them to go ahead while he handles the owls. Rudd uses his flashing magic stone to take down all the owls. The group is taking a break and Neen commands Lily's commandeering skills. Lily promises to keep doing her best for the squad, but Lilia is perplexed by her new behavior. Neen noticed that they could now choose to let Rudd absorb their damage, using his shield sacrifice skill during their last battle. Rudd is surprised, but they all confirm what Neen said. Marius tells Rudd that he became stronger after their battle and he tells Rudd he has him to thank for that. Neen tells him they can now dispel the ability if they don't want him to take damage for them. Marius tells Rudd he has an exceptional skill set because only a few tanks can perfectly draw the attention of monsters, Marius tells him he would be even more exceptional if he learned the self-heal skill. Rudd wonders if there's a skill like that and Marius is surprised humans don't know about it. Rudd realizes that Marius isn't human, and he tells Marius there's a lot they don't know about him and everyone agrees with him. After he became their ally, they forgot to ask him about details of himself. Rudd asks him to tell them about himself, but tells him he doesn't have to say what he doesn't want them to know. Marius takes a while to think and then he tells them he's a demonoid, which surprises Rudd. Generally, creatures of their world are divided into humans and demi-humans, but in the past, there used to be demonoid ads as well. Demonoids look similar to demi-humans, but unlike demi-humans who worship the god of humans, demonoids pledge their loyalty to a demon. He tells Rudd that is the short version of details about himself. He can only manage a labyrinth because he's a demonoid. He explains that humans use the labyrinths for their benefit but labyrinths were created to destroy the world of humans. Neen is surprised that it wasn't their god who created the labyrinth to enrich the humans. Marius tells her that the story was made up, but Lilia tells him that was what they were all told while growing up. Lily confirmed this, but she's sure someone once knew the truth in the past. Marius tells them the Keeled Labyrinth is probably also managed by a demonoid and the demonoid is a powerful one. He tells Rudd to be careful when he fights the Guardian. Rudd asks him if he's okay with fighting against his people and Marius tells him he doesn't like them because of what they are doing with their lives. Marius apologizes for accompanying him to fight a personal battle. Rudd tells him he considers him a friend and he appreciates his support. Lilia tells him she's cool with him as long as he doesn't hurt Lily, and Lily says the same about Lilia. They all tell him they're cool and with and Marius thanks Rudd for letting him stick with them. Lily decides that they need to discuss how they'll defeat the monsters on the next floor and Rudd gives her the floor. They come closer and discuss their battle plans, but Lilia can't understand Lily's new behavior. They progress through the 49th floor, taking down all the monsters, and they eventually got to the 50th floor. The Bone Dragon welcomes them to the floor and Rudd swings into action. He uses his provoked skill to attract the dragon, and he thinks Lily's strategy will work well. He remembers when she talked about the Bone Dragon and how they could cause status effects which would disrupt their formation. She told Rudd he'll charge ahead while they stay out of the dragon's attack range. Her sister and Marius would attack the dragon from outside its range. She told them it would be better to use crushing attacks rather than slashing attacks because the dragon is made of bones. She told them to enchant their weapons with fire before taking a dragon on because they are susceptible to fire. She tells them to use fire as their primary spell and warns them that the dragon's body will turn red once it loses a certain amount of health. The dragon attacks Rudd, but he blocks it and it suddenly showers him with a barrage of bones. But Rudd shields himself, Lily provides him with some support and he thanks her. Rudd realizes he has to stay away from the dragon's wings, he decides to draw its attention before moving. As soon as he moves, the dragon attacks him, but he blocks the hit. Luna is worried about the knockback of the attack, but Neen tells her it's all part of the plan. Rudd didn't expect the dragon to be so fast. Marius and Lilia suddenly attack the monster, and Rudd thanks them for their help. They keep attacking the monster and Rudd is convinced he'll be fine as long as he sees the monster's attack coming, the monster suddenly prepares an AoE attack that scratches Lilia and Marius. Rudd tells Neen to heal them from the poison attack while he distracts the monster. Neen and Luna heal them while Rudd and Lily engage the monster. Lily uses a fire spell and Rudd tries his provoked skill but the monster is now immune. Lily tells him to brace for attack, and the monster shoots a thick sludge at him, but he blocks it. The sludge is making his shield heavy, so he asks someone to help him out with a water spell. Neen helps him out and she can see the battle will be a long one, so she casts an area spell but boosts everyone's absorbed shield recovery. She tells them to make good use of it, but after an hour they still haven't defeated the monster. The dragon's color suddenly changes and it cooks up a strong flame and Lily tells everyone to get out of the dragon's range. Rudd charges the dragon and blocks its flame. 
He uses his provoked skill and the monster attacks him, which takes a lot out of his absorbed shield. He goes to replenish it, while Marius and Lilia attack the dragon, the others support them with fire spells, and Rudd provokes the monster so it keeps attacking him. Rudd suddenly uses his life conversion skill to take down the dragon, and it drops its materials. Neen congratulates him for clearing the 50th floor. She wonders if he'll raid the 51st floor next, but he tells her they've done enough for the day. They return to their lodge, and Lily suggests they hold off on selling the drop materials they got so word doesn't spread about their raid progress. Rudd agrees with her, and Neen is impressed with Lily's commands. Neen is hyped for the customary after party, but Lilia tells them she can't attend the party because she's too tired. She heads back to her room and Lily follows her, but Rudd isn't happy about this. The story continues, we see everyone gathers in the dining room to celebrate their first raid of the Keeled Labyrinth. Neen is so happy to have some alcohol that Luna thinks it must be very good. Neen offers to give her a sip, and Rudd wonders if it'll be okay for her to try it. Luna begs him to let her take a sip and he gives in to her cute appeal. She takes Nin's cup and takes a few gulps, and she almost throws up because the taste is so bad. Nin tells her she'll need to get used to the taste, and Luna wonders why she let her try it. Nin just wanted to see her reaction to alcohol for the first time, and she tells Luna it'll get better if she tries it more often, Nin immediately changes the topic. She noticed that Rudd has been getting closer to Lilia and Lily. Rudd tells her his relationship with them hasn't changed, Neen asks for Luna's opinion about the topic, but Rudd tells her not to drag Luna into the discussion. Luna also noticed that Rudd was getting close with the twins, and Rudd thinks the alcohol made her drunk. This makes Luna fume, but Rudd tells them he was just worried about them and he didn't want to cause them any trouble. Rudd tells them the relationship doesn't go beyond friendship and Neen asks him to consider a romantic relationship with her. Rudd tells her he can't consider that at the moment because raiding Labyrinth is the most important thing for him. Neen concludes that they have to finish up with the raids as soon as possible. Luna seems happy that Rudd isn't seeing anyone and Rudd wonder why she's having such a reaction. Luna tells him she's always happy and her heart always feels warm when she's around him. She tells him she wants to be with him forever, and Rudd is surprised by this. Neen can see that Rudd is becoming popular among the ladies. Rudd offers Luna some water and she looks heartbroken. He thinks that she's completely drunk and Neen can see that she'll be a handful. Rudd leaves the table and goes into his room, but he's surprised to see Lilia sleeping on his bed. Lilia welcomes Rudd to his bedroom, and Rudd wonders why she's sleeping on his bed. She tells Rudd how Marius let her in and told her to guard his bedroom. She didn't realize she was so tired at that time, so she fell asleep. Rudd asks her what she wants to talk about and Lilia tells him she wants to talk about Lily. She noticed how hard Lily worked in the labyrinth and Rudd was also impressed by Lily's performance. Lilia knew Lily was a kid who could always do anything she set her mind to if she took her time to it. Rudd can now see that there isn't much gap between the twins' abilities. Lilia can see that Lily is trying so hard to change that she pushed herself to exhaustion. She asks Rudd if he finds change scary, and he tells her he doesn't like change much. He remembered when Avancia started to change. He wanted things to still remain the same. He thinks many people still share the same idea with him, and he's still not sure he's doing the right thing for the village, but he's sometimes happy to embrace changes. He knows Avancia won't be as lively as it is if it didn't change. He tells Lilia it's important to enjoy the change because it could be positive. Lilia always thought it was best to leave things the way they were. She still thinks so because she realized she was weaker than Lily. Lilia wants to support Lily, but she feels lonely seeing Lily change and drift away from her. Rudd realizes that Lilia may find it hard to adapt to change unlike Lily, who wants to be independent. He tells Lilia that though things are bound to change, he's sure the sisters would never change. He's convinced they will always love each other and remain close. He tells Lilia she can still get along with Lily, just like they do now, even if things change. Lilia is thankful for his advice. She's surprised by his thoughtfulness, and he tells her he was just saying whatever came to his mind. Rudd told Lilia exactly what she wanted to hear. Lily shone so bright while they were raiding the labyrinth that Lilia couldn't even look at her. She promises to watch Lily do her best the next day while they are in the labyrinth. Rudd encourages her and she vows to keep her promise. The next day, they return to the labyrinth, and Lily is about to use her dungeon walk skill to send them to the 51st floor. She reminds everyone that there's not much information about that level because the major clans couldn't get past that floor. She knows that the floor is covered in a thick mist, and she advises them to use another means to locate the monsters instead of detection magic. Rudd decides that Lily would use detection magic while he and Marius detect monsters within their visual range. 
Rudd tells Luna to remain on guard and Luna tells him she didn't mean anything she said the previous night. Neen is impressed Luna didn't black out after drinking, Lily activates her magic and they arrive at the 51st floor. Rudd can see that the mist is really thick and Lily tells him they won't be able to use detection magic on that floor. Rudd asks Luna to try and clear the mist with her wind magic. Luna casts her wind magic, but it doesn't clear up the mist. Marius tells them the mist was created with magic, so wind won't dispel it. Marius tells Rudd to focus on detecting the magic within the monsters if he wants to find them. Rudd tries to detect the monsters, but he only gets a vague sensation. He tries again and he gets a proper sensation that a monster is approaching. He warns everyone to be on guard and he uses his taunt skill. Rudd is hit with water magic while several hands grab at them from the mist. Neen thinks the monster is a Sahajin and Luna decides to take it out with her magic, but it's ineffective. Neen realizes that the mist is so thick that they don't have vision of the monster. Rudd uses his sensation and he sees there's an area not covered by the mist. He tells everyone to move towards that direction and they all hurry there. Rudd uses his taunt skill on the monster which forces it out of the mist. Rod can see the monster is a Sahajin but there are three of them. Rudd is fighting one off and another one tries to attack him but he blocks it. The third is about to attack him but Marius comes to his aid and takes it out. Though Marius can't see through the mist, he can still detect the monster's energy. Rudd and Marius finally mastered their special detection skill and they were able to defeat the all Sahajin. They decide to take a break before proceeding to the next floor and the ladies decide to make lunch. Marius is surprised they are cooking up the Sahajin for lunch and Neen tells him they need to replenish their energy. Rudd is surprised by the drop they got from the monsters and Lilia can see they are of high quality. She thanks Rudd for helping her overcome her fears and be able to look Lily in the eyes. Neen tells them lunch is ready and Marius tells them the Sahajin tastes delicious. They replenish their energy and move on to the next floor. The floor is very spacious, and Rudd notices it's devoid of fog. They think it's a boss floor, and Marius warns them an enemy is approaching. A magic circle suddenly appears, and a dark skeleton is summoned. Blue, red, and yellow crystals float behind it, and Rudd is surprised to find a monster he's never seen before. Rudd uses his sacrificial shield skill. The aura of the monster is so menacing, it's unlike the other monsters they faced. Rudd tells Lily to give the others orders while he starts with physical attacks. He rushes at the skeleton and uses his taunt skill, but the yellow crystal creates a shield in front of the skeleton, which surprises him. Rudd considers putting some distance between them, but the red crystal shoots a fireball at him. Rudd wonders what the blue crystal does, but the monster suddenly becomes faster and almost gets a hit with its sword, but Rudd blocks it. He figures out that the yellow crystal is for defense, the red crystal is for magical attacks, and the blue crystal enhances the skeleton's physical abilities. Rudd realizes that the monster would be tricky to defeat, and he wonders how they'll take it down. He decides to attract its attention while the others attack from behind. He uses his taunt skill while Lilia and Marius attack from behind, but their attacks are blocked, which surprises them. Marius realizes the monster can only deploy the crystal abilities in the direction they are facing. Rudd confirms his theory when he rushes at the skeleton, but the shield skill doesn't activate. They decide to keep attacking, but they're suddenly blinded by a bright light emanating from the skeleton. Rudd thinks it's a distraction, but after the light goes off, Marius can see that Lilia isn't looking too good. She shivers for some time and she suddenly attacks Marius. Marius wonders what is wrong with her, and she tells him not to bully Lily. She sees memories of someone bullying Lily, and she tries her best to protect her. She thinks Marius is the one bullying Lily, so she keeps fighting against him. Rudd tells Neen to cure her, but she informs him that Luna and Lily were affected by the skeleton's attack. She decides to heal them first and Rudd realizes only Neen Marius and him are immune to abnormal status ailments. Rudd knows if they all fall into the abnormal status they'll be wiped out. The skeleton attacks him and he uses his life conversion skill to send it flying, even with its shield activated. Rudd tells Marius to hold back the skeleton while he handles Lilia. He uses his taunt skill on her and she attacks him. He pins her down and tries to snap her out of her illusion, but she keeps going on about him bullying Lily. Rudd remembers their conversation on the rooftop about their childhood, and he wonders if the abnormal status triggered her past trauma. He decides to say calming words to dispel the cause of her trauma. He reassures her that they are safe now and she sees a vision of Rudd coming to their aid when they were kids. Rudd offers her his hand and tells her to calm down because everyone is with her. Rudd promises to always protect them both, and Lilia snaps out of the abnormal status. Rudd tells her what happened, but he sees she still looks shaken. 
He reassures her that there are people she can count on for help, and she becomes calm. Rudd tells Marius to take a break and get healed up. Marius tells him he needs to destroy the yellow crystal before he can fight the skeleton effectively. The skeleton suddenly attacks Rudd with a fire spell from the red crystal, and Rudd realizes it's trying to trap him. He asks Neem for support and she casts a water spell to give him protection against the fire. He moves through the fire and tries to attack the skeleton, but it blocks it with the shield from the yellow crystal. Rudd wonders if there's a way to break through the shield when he notices some water droplets from his hair passing through it. He realizes the shield can't protect against physical and magic damage at the same time and he informs Lilia and Marius of this. Lilia and Rudd decide to attack the skeleton at the same time. The skeleton shields Rudd's attack, but Lilia's fireball passes through and hurts it. They try to attack the skeleton with a barrage of magic attacks, but it blocks it. Rudd tells them to attack the skeleton simultaneously and Lilia is able to land a hit. The skeleton decides to use its abnormal status skill, but Lilia is now immune because Neen nullified the skeleton's magic. They attack the skeleton with their magic simultaneously and Neen notices the skeleton is about TK activate its shield and escape. Rudd rushes at the skeleton and Neen is worried he'll be affected by their magic spells. Rudd tells her he'll use his life conversion skill to transfer the damage to the skeleton. He moves through their spells and uses his life conversion skill to land a powerful attack. They can see the skeleton is weakened, but the skeleton suddenly gets up and splits in two the crystals also split in two, which surprises them. Both skeletons attack Rudd and Rudd tells Lilia and Marius to face one while he faces the other. Marius isn't sure which skeleton is the real one, and they decide to attack anyone before Rudd is overwhelmed. Luna uses her magic on one skeleton, but it shields it and they're able to identify it as the real one. They try to attack it but it shields their attack, Rudd can see it's reacting differently so he decides to put an end to the skeleton. The shield breaks and the monster evaporates, Rudd picks up the drop from the monster. Lily decides to use detection magic to find the magic circle leading to the next floor before they take a break, she tells Rudd she can't detect a magic circle, and Rudd wonders if they're on the final floor. He asks Marius for his thoughts and Marius tells him the Guardian was probably scared away after seeing them defeat its masterpiece. Rudd realizes the Guardian sealed the way to stop them from advancing and he decides to head back. A vampire suddenly spawns and bites into his neck. Rudd tries to react, but the vampire goes out of his range. He sees her aura is very menacing, but suddenly four dark skeletons spawn but the Guardian quickly takes them out because she forgot to stop them from spawning. Marius realizes the vampire is the Labyrinth Guardian. He didn't expect a Demon Lord class guardian to spawn. That brings the episode to an end. Thanks for watching. Want next part subscribe the channel and turn on notification bell.